Welcome to SNC Critical Insights. With us today is Senior Chair Raj Cohen, SNC Partner Karen Seymour, and of Council Senior Advisor Jay Clayton, who recently returned from being head of the SEC. Today they'll be discussing what directors should be focusing on. So Raj, why don't we start with you in terms of what directors should be uh, focused on coming out of the pandemic? Well, thanks, Karen. There are obviously a number of priorities for the directors on every board, and we're going to spend time on ESG issues, uh, and that is in the forefront of every board's mind. But I think in our view, the first indeed existential issue for every board must be cybersecurity and cyber resilience. The number of cyber attacks and their sophistication is increasing exponentially. And the potential hard and soft dollar costs are far beyond the amount amount you'd be prepared to pay in a ransomware attack or even the compromising of the company's information about itself and its customers. We're at the point where a successful cyber attack on a business could create devastating harm, not only to the business, but to its customers and to the public more generally. And the cyber attacks are coming from all directions, your own systems, the systems of your vendors and your counterparties, and now the systems of those you have hired to protect you from cyber attack. There's no prescribed or best approach for a board to deal with the cyber threat. The best approach for any individual company will be highly dependent on each company's unique circumstances. At this point, I want to turn it over to Jay to pick up. But I think, Raj, every company should have a regularized approach for the board to be informed about and consider its company's cyber profile, the threats, the potential attacks, and the defenses. It should be a discussion point at virtually every board meeting. Um, And the board should be continually asking whether there are additional resources, financial or personnel, that are necessary to counter the cybersecurity threats to the organization. This is a question that should be asked not just of the CEO, but of the persons principally responsible for cybersecurity, operations generally, and internal audit. Relatedly, the board should be asking whether third-party reviews are desirable. Should there be benchmarking? Should there be information sharing? And I think, Raj, you and I have discussed this point a lot in the past. Information sharing across the industry that you're in, um, but also information sharing with government authorities. You do not want your first call to government authorities to be when you have an incident. You want to have established that chain of communication ahead of time. Um, And for those, in particular, for those companies that are subject to the administration's recent executive order or other regulatory requirements, the board should have regular reports on regulatory compliance and regulatory communication. And you and I have also discussed this, and I'd I'd love your views. Um, The board composition and the composition of uh, what I would say is experts among the executive ranks, as well as resources, it's appropriate for the board to regularly ask, do we have the right people around the table? There's There's no prescribed group of people, but do we have the right people around the table? That is a fundamental question, and it's a fundamental question about the board itself and about senior management. It is very difficult to obtain true cyber expertise in the boardroom, but it's a quality that should be uh, sought uh, in every uh, mixture of board qualifications and requirements but really where the expertise is critical is in senior management. 
do you have the right person running your cybersecurity as a whole, and what about the people under her or him? And I would add on that that it's really critical to have already, maybe it's through your desktop exercises or otherwise, that you've run through who your external advisors are as well, because they're also critical in responding to a crisis as it unfolds, and whether that be the forensic experts, uh, the council, other technical experts who can help jump on a problem. But all of this should have been rehearsed, planned through various reviews and steps so that this isn't the first time that you're thinking what would happen in a crisis. Yeah, let me let me pick up on that. It's right. It's not a siloed issue. Cybersecurity, cyber resilience requires an understanding of the business, its operations, its vendors, its customers. You can't look at it as a board of directors as three slides in the board deck. It has to be understood across across the operations of the entity as a whole. Let's let's shift uh, for a moment to talk about the focus on ESG. It's obviously a topic that boards and management are spending an enormous amount of time on, um, and rightfully so. So, Jay, let me turn to you first. How should boards be thinking about that issue? Well, Karen, I think it's important that you look at E, S, and G as individual components. Um, and for each company, E, S, and G are probably somewhat different, depending on whether you're vertically integrated or not, what industry you operate in. And y- you need to bring different expertise and oversight depending on the, the context of the company. That said, you have to recognize that from the outside, these issues are often looked at together and people are searching for commonality. So it's a, it's a struggle at the board level. You have to recognize the individual characteristics of your company for E, S, and G but also recognize that your investors and other constituents are trying to look at them consistently. It it is a struggle. Um, Let me make one point here, that ensuring that your E, S, and G communications, your disclosure, are consistent with your actual actions is essential. That, it's much better to be candid and clear about what you're doing on each one of these things than to provide what I would say is puffery that doesn't really describe the operations of the company. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think one of the the risks that companies have as they have rushed, there's been a lot of pressure to get voluntary disclosures out on ESG principles. And sometimes there are, again, silos within a company so that the disclosures may not have the same rigorous vetting process as other disclosures. And obviously, now that we have the SEC task force focusing on ESG disclosures, uh, it should be very clear to companies that they really have to ensure, even though it is hard uh, to know exactly what the standards are, there's not unified standards for us, but companies need to be very rigorous about what they can announce, and they shouldn't be so uh, aspirational that they're creating problems for themselves and the future litigation risk. You used two terms, Karen, which I think are so critical here. The first was silos, and the second was aspirational. The silo responsible for uh, certainly E or S is going to be aspirational, but the disclosure has to be reality. And I'll uh, just pick up on a, on a third word you used, Karen, which was rigor. It may not be the same rigor as financial disclosure in terms of disclosure controls and procedures, but you should have analogous rigor in terms of, is this really how we're operating when you make those types of disclosures? And Jay, you made a point earlier, which is so important again, And that is that every company is different, or at least every industry is different. And as a key example, most companies will make their e-disclosure about themselves, but there is a substantial group of companies, financial institutions, that are going to need to make disclosures not only about themselves, but about their customers. 
and that is a, an increasingly difficult task, and but one which they're going to need to accomplish. I agree. And the mix of quantitative and qualitative disclosure that that type of third-party analysis um, requires, let's put it this way, again, highly idiosyncratic. It is very difficult to find a template for disclosure about third parties that meets the types of standards that you would expect. And related to the ESG, but not always focused on with the same rigor as climate change and the big E, are the social justice issues that in the aftermath of George Floyd's killing, we know that companies have said a lot and they've done a lot. There's been a lot of work and that has caught the attention of investors and there's a lot of important statements and programs that companies are doing. And I was wondering, you know, Raj or Jay, if either of you could comment on sort of the diversity efforts and how boards should be thinking about them um, in terms of the real flight to capital that is focusing on these important issues. Well, Karen, I think that the way the marketplace expects disclosure here is really in two areas. One is board composition and senior executives and how you take into account diversity and board selection and promotion, hiring of senior executives, and then diversity across the workforce. And you know, I think we're seeing what I would say is more fulsome disclosure about the former and expect that we will see requirements um, around disclosure about the latter. And boards would be wise to start focusing on both of them. Fully agree. This is a company-wide issue, as Jay said, not just at the board level, not just at senior executive levels, but throughout the organization. And it will be important to indicate and demonstrate that there is a company-wide commitment to uh, diversity and to inclusion and that includes pay gaps as well as just number of individuals. I think that's a really important point. We are seeing much more activism on this topic, and I would expect that there will be more shareholder activism in this area as well. You know, there has been real focus in the last proxy season on comments about diversity, composition of the board, but going beyond to pay gaps and what are uh, the real plans for boards. I also have seen a real, uh, I think there's been demands for racial audits. And we saw that recently, you know, there have been, at least BlackRock has agreed to do a racial audit. Some of the other uh, companies, JP Morgan and J&J, faced in the proxy season uh, those those demands, but they, they lost, but they got more than a third of the votes. So I think personally, these racial audits, more clarity about what is going on within companies is going to be something that's going to stick with us. And I, I don't really see that going away at all in terms of what is expected for boards and for companies. Uh, let, me, let me offer a comment here, Karen, which is as, as the board... I think it's important to look around and see which companies have performed well in this area. And for my money, and let's just uh, say that this is anecdotal, not, not a survey, my money, the companies that incorporate diversity into what I would say is everyday operations, but from the perspective that it drives value, they get more buy-in and they make more progress. And that is, that is a much more successful strategy for my money than trying to be reactionary to the marketplace, to actually make your workforce understand that it drives value and get buy-in throughout the middle management ranks. And to go back for a moment uh, to a point made during our discussion of cybersecurity, a board should want to know who has the responsibility for these issues within the company. And uh, 
20 years ago, often the chief risk officer, chief compliance officer was someone who didn't make it in the finance group, no longer. That's a very senior key executive. Today, the human resources officer, the lead in that group, should be a trained professional who understands the world around her or him. And and makes this a shared responsibility across the organization. Absolutely. And having the correct disclosures and public comments that accompany that. I, I would know that there have been at least 12 public companies that have been sued uh, recently for alleged false statements about their diversity commitments. And again, I think we're going to see as there's more and more disclosures out there, uh, we will see more challenges to that. And I think there will be increased derivative litigation um, cha- challenging these, these commitments. Also, Karen, going back to a point you made a, a few minutes ago about uh, the proxy status situation, Engine One and Exxon should be a not just a wake-up call, it should be a clarion call to every company out there. These large institutional investors obviously hold major positions in almost every major company, and if they are going to be supportive of a shareholder resolution, it has a substantial possibility of being adopted. So what what does a board do about this? For years now, there's been a recognition that there has to be outreach by the board in terms of such issues on say on pay with leading investors. There needs to be outreach on E and S for sure today, and those will not necessarily be the same people at the large institutional investors who are looking at G, back to the point that E, S, and G are not all the same. It's a really important point. And then you add to it, though, one concern is as you add uh, new participants in the market, so you add Gen Y investors, for example, they're going to behave very, very differently than uh, some of the pension funds and institutional investors in the past. I wonder if we want to talk for a moment about political contributions, um, because that has been something that we've seen a focus on as companies have been challenged about their political contributions. And we've seen a number of companies put political contributions on pause in the wake of the election. And I wonder if there are thoughts that you have, Raj, about what boards should be doing when they're thinking about their, their contributions. So this is the ultimate damned if you do, damned if you don't. These contributions really do not buy the access, which some people seem to think they do. My own view is that there is probably more downside than upside today in making political uh, contributions. And I know that's against the general grain of accepted truth, but it is the reality that I'm not sure you make that many friends and you do make real enemies. Well, I, I, I share your view that that's unfortunate. And I share your view that it's accurate. And what I'll just add to that is defining what is and is not a political contribution has become exceedingly difficult in terms of where are the dollars actually going. And I think that that's a further challenge, frankly, we all need to face, and not just in, not just in the boardroom, but uh, in, our, in our political funding system more generally. But speaking just for a board member, it does make it very difficult to make these types of uh, contributions. Shifting uh, to another topic, which is independent board leadership. This is a, a trend for some time. And Jay, I thought from your position, you would be ideally situated to share your thoughts on that. I, I always like to use this phrase that independent doesn't mean isolated. What, what, you, what you want with, with independence is somebody who's going to bring, not somebody, but a group of people who are going to bring varying different perspectives, different questions before management. And of course, the role is to challenge management, but the role is also to support management. And I think this is sometimes missed. You need to challenge, 
you need to probe, you need to ask hard questions, but all in the vein of supporting the performance of the company in all, in all of the areas that we have talked about. And I think that getting that mix correct between being challenging, being rigorous, but also doing it in a way that's supportive is what you're looking for in the mix of those independent people, all bringing different skills. And this is why I think, you know, fr frankly, diversity is a value add proposition because you get that different areas of challenge, different areas of support when you have a diverse group of experience on a board. So Jay makes such a critical point here. The question of independence is often reduced to the single issue of whether the CEO is also chairman of the board or that position of chairman must be held separately. Independence is far, far more than that. It is independence of thought and independence of action within the boardroom. That's an excellent point. Another area to talk about today is executive compensation, another area of focus coming out of the pandemic. Uh, sure, Karen. And, and, and look, a, a number of years ago, we, d we decided that to align executive interests with shareholder interest, a great deal of executive pay uh, would be in the form of equity. Um, at some point, those executives do want liquidity, and they will need to sell to have liquidity. And, and of course, it's the, it's the role of compensation committees to think about that continued alignment of interest as people are getting liquidity. What we saw in the pandemic with volatile share prices, particularly in the area of pharmaceuticals, was 10 v 5 one plans coming under scrutiny. Were people getting liquidity at times when it just didn't seem like they should? Um, or were they canceling 10 v 5 one plans, not getting liquidity, possibly holding off for a higher share price? Those are questions that should be asked in the compensation structure at the compensation committee. Have we put in place appropriate checks, not only around the alignment of interest, but also the liquidity to ensure that not only is the executive not taking advantage of short-term movements in the stock price, but that it doesn't even appear that they could be. And I think that's, that's an important part of corporate hygiene. And overlay with that share buybacks, which are under scrutiny. And one question that's continually asked is, are share buybacks engaged in with an eye towards someone's compensation? And again, to the extent that issue can be taken off the table, so much better than to have to defend it. So one other topic that we wanted to think about today is sort of the eroding of the legal standard in terms of the board's duty of oversight, particularly in Delaware, where there's a line of recent cases that we want to think about. As I hope everyone knows, there's been a long line of leading cases, beginning with the Caremark decision, that made it clear that a board would not be held liable unless there were clearly some visible red flags for the board that something serious was wrong or amiss. But there are some cases that are recent that have refused to dismiss complaints under this, what we thought was a settled care mark standard. And we don't see the recent cases as necessarily creating a higher standard for the board generally or to their duties, but we do see them as identifying a particular red flag for all boards to think about, and that's regulatory compliance. And there are some industries, such as pharmaceutical companies and financial institutions that we know are very, very comprehensively uh, regulated more than others, and all industries are regulated to some extent. But Raj, I'd, I'd like to turn to you to think about that line of cases and what you see for boards to think about what they should be doing in light of these new cases. I would like to see these cases as actually consistent with Caremark, notwithstanding the view that they may be eroding Caremark. In particular, what I think these cases really stand for, beyond the fact that bad facts make bad law, is that regulatory criticism, to your point, Karen, is a red flag. And Every board should be asking whether it is comprehensively regulated or regulated only to a limited extent, what criticisms 
are being made by the regulators, what questions are being asked, and that should be a regular part of board meetings to make sure the directors are informed. If they are informed, management can say to them, the criticisms are unwarranted or the criticisms are being remedied satisfactorily, but at least the board should be asking and then examining uh, management's response. I agree completely, Raj. This this goes back to the, the relationship with the regulators that we talked about in cyber. And the, the board should be regularly apprised of where the firm stands with respect to its regulatory relationship, management's assessment, and question and probe whether that assessment is correct or not. And I think I, I will go so far as to say that if a board does that, I think you've satisfied your care mark obligations. Agree. Absolutely. For more insights from SNC, please visit our podcast channel, SNC Critical Insights, where more of our partners discuss emerging issues. Thank you.